Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on the show, consumer crusader Ralph Nader on his attitude to the 2016 election, some shorts from our Republican and Democratic convention coverage, interviews with people that you've never seen, and finally, a few thoughts from me on winner-take-all media coverage and why it hurts. All that coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. So ours is a beautiful country, wrote Howard Zinn at some point, except it's been taken over by people who have no respect for human life, liberty, or freedom. Our job, wrote Zinn, is to take that power and that country back. And that's exactly what our next guest has been doing his entire life. He quotes Howard Zinn in his new book, and his dedication is to the notion that a small minority of people can make an enormous difference. We can break through power, he writes, and he says everywhere he speaks. Ralph Nader has also put that phrase on the front of a new book, Breaking Through Power. It's easier than you think. It's just out from City Limits Books. Ralph, welcome to the program. Glad to have you back. Thank you, Laura. So let's start. I mean, let's start with the election stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got... Um, Bernie Sanders getting 12 million votes. You've got Donald Trump, whatever you think of him, upsetting the GOP establishment apple cart. Um, and yet people still feel as discouraged as ever about the system. What's going on? Well, uh, Bernie sort of aborted his movement when he endorsed Hillary without qualification at the convention. That sort of shattered it. He's trying to bring it together with this little group called Our Revolution. But I, I don't see it happening unless they put full-time organizers on the ground. Now, he and, said he changed the convention platform. He got pro more progressive elements in the Democratic yeah, why, Party look, platform than ever. That's right. But look what Hillary's done since, right? And she's not talking $15 an hour. She's just talking raising minimum wage. She's not going after TPP in her recent speeches because she doesn't want to embarrass her main supporter, Barack Obama, who's going to try to ram it through Congress in December in the That's lame duck issue. The trans She policy. is not saying, Wall Street, uh, I, here I come, you're going to be afraid of me, the way she did when she was going after uh, uh, Bernie's vote. So she's reverting back to the corporatist, war-mongering Hillary Clinton. I mean, the best button for Hillary Clinton is a nice picture in the middle, and on the top, more war, and on the bottom, more Wall Street. So Bernie did exactly what you didn't do, as he ran inside the party. What's yeah. your verdict? Doesn't sound too positive. He, he did the right thing running inside, but he should have maintained an autonomy. Instead, uh, they vanquished him and just uh, absorbed his, his uh, energy and, and are, pro are proceeding to betray it. Yeah, and what do you make of what he's been saying since about third parties are okay as long as it's only at the local level, not national? Well, that's because he recognizes we have a rigged system run by two parties uh, that have created a duopoly, winner take all, and they've told people, look, you're wasting your vote, just uh, vote for either one of us. And if you don't break that with proportional representation, single, you know, uh, the, the uh, rank voting, as they call it, more parties, uh, getting rid of gerrymandering. Uh, it's, it's just going to get worse every four years. If you cast a least worst vote, uh, let's say for the Democrat, Republican, you're guaranteed to lose your bargaining power. They'll never look back because they know they got you, least worst. And every four years it gets worse. So the key is civic organization in the congressional districts to upend the system. And he's right, it's good to start locally because you know most local offices are dominated by one party and often there's no opposing major party uh, uh, for the office. And so there's a real opportunity mm. at, at the minimum to come in second mm. and build the base. But what about Donald Trump? I mean, alarm bells sound on every front. I can't go anywhere without somebody telling me that the apocalypse is nigh, is it? Well, the amazing thing is how many people still are sticking with him. He has been shown to cheat everything he meets just about. He's cheated his workers, his creditors, his consumers, Trump University. Uh, he's, he's cheated taxpayers. He doesn't pay hardly any taxes, and he's a corporate welfare king. Uh, and The New York Times today called him the uh, king of the tax break. Yeah. And, uh, and here he is. He has people of relatively modest income who are being ripped off right and left. They're supporting him. 
that's what happens when you only have two choices and they can't stand Hillary. They go for him because he's the outsider. And also, they do want to believe. That's the history of politics when he said, don't worry, I'll fix the immigration. I'll fix the health care. We're going to get rid of Obamacare, but I've got a plan. He never says what the plan mm -hmm. is. He is a boastful prevaricator of the first order. And the only reason he's on the stage is because we have a two-party tyranny. And he's made a lot of money for the media, which gives him free publicity. So he has turned politics from a circus into a burlesque show. Mm. And, and that's interesting for people. You know, people turn on the TV, they watch the debate. It's going to be the biggest uh, debate turnout in history. Dan Rather today. wrote this week that um, politi the, the pressmen, I think he said, or journalists are falling over backwards yeah. to be fair, and that's what Trump has been able to manipulate. I, I thought, you know, ratings have a bit to do with it. Well, look, the, the, the problem is, is worse than that. This man is an empty suit. Yeah. He's a boaster, uh, and he's a bully, and he's a liar, and he never corrects himself. You put those traits in the White House, you have disaster. So should you at the national level take, cost your vote? If, if you're not, if you're, if, if you're not in a, in a, if you're in a contested state, a highly contested state? You go to way. someone who is gonna vote for Hillary and you thinking, and, and say, look, uh, let's, let's not vote. You, you, you basically pull away from, uh, vote from Hillary and pull away a vote from Trump. Actually, there's a computer system to encourage people to do that. And then you can vote for your choice, Libertarian or, or uh, uh, you know, Green Party. But that's, I mean... So that's the, what you recommend people doing it? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's disgraceful. Moment. You know, you have to be that way. Most countries have multi-party systems. They have proportional representation, instant runoff voting. Uh, and they don't say to you, uh, you're going to be a loser and you're going to waste your vote unless you vote for the two parties that have brought us this corrupt political system that's driving our country into the ground. So let's go back to your book for a second. I mean, you could look at it and say you, you make two kind of contradictory arguments. On the one hand, you say government and the corporate state are less responsive now than they were in the 60s when Unsafe yeah. at Any Speed was written, when consumer advocacy of your sort was yeah. really pioneered. And at the same time, you say... Um, we should do more of that kind of activism. So, yeah, so, it's, so it's, it's, not, it? it's not contradictory. It's just if you ask people what's the main instrument for a vibrant democracy in this country, what do you think they'd say? They're not. It's the Congress. Mm -hmm. You know, it's got the most of our power in one place, 535 human beings, and we can't control them. You've got 1,500 corporations who don't have a single vote, yeah. and they control majority of the members of Congress with cash and offers of jobs and so forth and we can't control them back home. One percent of the people organized in Congress watchdog hobbies. Well, let's face it, you know, people are in hobbies, right? They watch birds, they collect stamps, they collect uh, antique cars, they, they are bowling enthusiasts, they play poker. They spend two to 500 hours a, a year on their hobby mm -hmm. and about 200 to $500 a year on their hobby. What if we had a watchdog of Congress hobby? Bingo, because there's a huge left-right alliance about fair play in this country, consumer protection. You think right-wing uh, people in this country uh, don't want a living wage? You know, they're working for uh, Walmart, and they say, you know, my ideology, I really like $8.50 an hour. You know, I don't want uh, 12 or 14. Nonsense. Yeah. When you get down to where people live, work, and raise their kids, uh, the ideology begins dissipating. Mm. They may still hold the difference on reproductive rights, school prayer, gun control. But on the other big issues of empire, of corporate waste, of breaking up the big banks, of Main Street over Wall Street, of civil liberties, of criminal justice reform, uh, they want to breathe clean air, clean water, eat safe food, have safe medicines. And all of that can be achieved by focusing on your two senators and representatives mm -hmm. and connecting with other people on the internet throughout the country. So it's an agenda drive, not just a single issue. Back in the 80s, yeah. I was part of the movements for medical attention for people with AIDS yeah. and for um, patients to have patients' rights right. and be taken seriously. And we were making real gains at yeah. the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. People were dying, but right. the, the movements were growing. And I always felt like we should grow this movement into a movement for single-payer health care. Right. 
Instead, what happened was we really focused cancer over here, AIDS over here, breast cancer over here, even types of cancers, different groups. The argument that I got and get today as people review all the, the anniversaries yeah. of those movements is, well, we would never have got the change we got if we hadn't been so laser focused, if you we can, tried to be broader. That's where you do both. You get all the laser focused groups to unify for the bigger change while you're working on uh, the, uh, the issue, the single issue of AIDS or cancer. Because that's where the energy is. They're already yeah. showing up. They're already got their, you know, arms locked. So a lot of people are showing up these days around Black Lives Matter or around yeah. this extraordinary native-led mobilization for yeah. s clean water and against drilling in yeah. the Dakotas. Um, is, are those examples of breaking through power like those you write about in the book? It is, but you see their opponents cut them off to pass with the legislatures. They control the legislatures. So we need a movement called Corporate Destruction Matters. <laughs> Are you going to start such a thing? Well, we have in different versions, but, you know, it's amazing how people will say to me, climate change is tremendously serious, we've got to do something about it. And I say, what about Congress? That's the only way you're going to really have a big switch from fossils and nuclear to re, uh, sustainable solar, wind, and energy efficiency. Mm. Oh, th Congress? That's not where the action mm. is. Hello. I mean, <laughs> that's not where the action is. When I go up on Capitol Hill, Laura, you know who I bump into? Yeah. I bump into coal industry lobbyists, oil industry lobbyists, nuclear lobbyists. Somehow they think that's where the action is. Mm -hmm. So you can't abandon your legislature who is holding massive amounts of your power as a citizen under the Constitution. You've well, got to recapture it. Chase Iron Eyes. One of the leaders of the Standing Rock protest is running for Congress. Isn't he doing just what you said? And are you going to go out there and support him? Yes. Well, uh, there are a lot of people to support. I'd like to have him on my program. One of my first missions in the 1950s were, uh, involved the oppression of Native Americans. We called them American Indians then. So I'm quite familiar with the struggle. And this, uh, this situation out there in North Dakota is really uh, arousing all the Native American uh, people around the country. So it's a great organizing focus for other battles that need to be conducted. Remember, my running mate in, in 96 and 2000 was Winona LaDuke, and she's been out there. That's right. What's the role he played by media in all of this? I remember when I was at FAIR, the Media Watch Group, we used to study coverage, and no, con no body, electoral body, was less well covered, in fact, than Congress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they have 450 full-time reporters covering Congress every day, and they're ditto-heading each other. They're not really digging into the We tend the to cover stories. the Senate, the presidential races, yeah. but not so much what's happening in the House. That's right. And also, for example, they don't cover the fact that the biggest budget in the federal government, $680 billion, is unauditable, Pentagon budget. Okay? So that's a big issue. You, that comes in 90% in the polls, or 95%. Every small business understands that. Everybody understands that when you're spending that kind of money and you're losing it all over the world and misusing it and the contractors are stealing the Pentagon uh, day after day, that it should be audited. Well, it's the only agency in the government that is not auditable <laughs> under federal law. So it's violating a federal law that kicked in in 1992. Now, isn't that a great left-right issue? That's not a technical matter, as you know, Laura, because that will point to enormous waste yeah. that can be used to rebuild the public works, enormous, uh, easy to go into wars overseas because you have a <clears throat> black budget mm -hmm. that's never audited in the, in the Pentagon, like uh, the toppling of Libya as the mm -hmm. regime, and now all the chaos, Hillary's war, I call it. She pushed very yeah. actively for it. We had a couple of questions from viewers. One of them had to do with revolution. She said, um, from everything she's learned from you, the two parties are impossible. Real change is never mm -hmm. going to come through the electoral system. What do you think the chance is for revolution in the United States, and what would be its rallying cry? <clears throat> the silent revolutions are the only ones that really succeed over the long run. And you just uh, defeat the members of Congress and, uh, and defeat the state legislatures. And if you don't defeat them, you, you scare them politically where they turn around. We had some of the most pro-corporate senators and representatives in the 1960s, uh, and they had their finger to the wind. They heard the rumble from the people and they became champions of consumer and environmental laws. So it's how many people turn out back home that scares the wits out of these politicians if they want to continue in their job. And if they want to fight it, they're going to lose their job. 
So there was one other question from the audience which had to do with money and politics. Someone saying, are baby steps around mm. reform of the influence of money mm -hmm. in politics worth it when you have such a concentration of wealth in so few hands? Isn't, pa isn't money inevitably going to have undue power? Only uh, if the votes are not organized to count. It all comes down to the people are the ones that have the votes. Yeah. The corporations have the money. But money doesn't elect politicians. Money puts ads on uh, TV to try to you know, deceive uh, uh, the people and uh, manipulate them. But if people do their homework and they know what the issues are and they know what the record of the uh, legislators are, there's nothing stopping them. Uh, so two last questions. Mm -hmm. um, we may come back to the election, but I've got two on my list. One has to do with um, today's capitalists. I was just in Rochester before that Buffalo. We were in Cleveland earlier this year for the Republican convention. You see the capitalists of the 19th century sort of invested in cities like that. You see legacy institutions with their names yeah. all over them. Mm -hmm. Rochester, Eastman House, huge museum. Today's capitalists, what, what are they investing? Where's the infrastructure that's coming of today's gilded Barons. A good point. They don't even have noblesse oblige. Uh, they're letting all what these happened? public facilities rot. But we've never had more capital, and a lot of it is the people's money, pension funds, mutual funds, all under control of the big corporations in Wall Street, and they're not using it productively. They want to speculate with it. They want to risk with it, because it's not their money, it's your money, and they can rake off huge fees, you see? So that's why we have to say, look, we own the major wealth in the country. Why do we let corporations control it? We own trillions of dollars of pension money. Workers own that. We own the public airways. We own the public lands. We own the public budgets, right? And, and we don't control what we own. So that's a big step forward, right? That's like hitting a double and you want to go to home plate. We already own the major wealth of our country and it only now needs to be controlled by various mechanisms and to make it into a major political issue where you never allow anybody running for political office that doesn't answer the question, legislator, challenger, why don't you support our owning, our controlling what we own? Mm. And they'll say, well, what do you mean? And then you go through the examples. That's why we don't have an audience network. That's why you're not on national TV, because they control our property and they decide who says what 24 hours a day, and they get it free. We're the landlords. And the ABC and NBC and all that, they're the tenants, and they pay us no rent. I mean, what are we, suckers? I mean, when are we going to start saying enough is enough, right? They're driving the country into the ground. They're driving our uh, trust to, to our descendants into the ground because we've got a shattered country and an economy and, a, and an ecology. How do you get people really upset to break their routine and show up at rallies, marches? Because that's what they're afraid of. The politicians in the pockets of the corporations are afraid of the people organizing. Mm -hmm. And if they don't organize, they know how to flatter them, fool them, and flummox them. But if they're organized, they're terrified. If they're organized left, right. You know, if a billionaire decides, say, I'm going to hire 1,000 full-time organizers, two in every district, and 30 in Washington, and here's the turnaround agenda. You know, full Medicare, living wage, cracking down on corporate crime, deploading the military budget, all that and more. You can't believe what will happen. There's never been a major movement in this country that doesn't start with full-time organizers. Labor, for example. The environmental movement, for example. The women's right to vote movement. Abolition. It's got to, of slavery. It's got to start with full-time Full-time organizers and how much of the population? <clears throat> Less than 1%. You've been holding in your lap a flyer for something. You yeah. want to tell us what it is? Yes, yeah, so this is the, uh, the way we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, Unsafe and Speed, my book that uh, got the auto industry regulated, with far less than 1%, by the way. <laughs> it's called breakingthroughpower.org. It's all streamed 64 hours in May and late September in Constitution Hall. Uh, you'll never see anything like it. This is like a graduate course in... Uh, contentious, effective civics. It gives you tools, it gives you open windows, it connects you with people who can help you, and it's as far away as your computer. So go to uh, breakingthroughpower.org and they'll tell you how to uh, get the streamed version. Ralph Nader, a different take on the 1% from his new book, Breaking Through Power is Easier Than You Think, just out from City Lights Books. Readers think, thinkers read.
Thanks so much for being with us. You're welcome, Laura Flanders. You may remember our special coverage from the Democratic and Republican conventions this past summer. Well, we put together two special shows, but we didn't get all the special material we collected in. So today, some bonus material of our interviews with delegates, activists, and local community members at those conventions. Take a look. The country is so divided, and everyone's bashing everyone else, and, and it, it, it is very concerning. illegal immigration. It's not just a city, it's a national issue. Uh, it undermines American culture and U.S. jobs, and it is the core of law-breaking at the federal level. The question is, for people who have been attracted to Bernie's message, whether they have the commitment, the real commitment and discipline to stick this out and fight for change over the long haul. And that doesn't mean running away because you lost the Democratic uh, presidential nomination. I believe that he has the gumption to be able to get the job done. Um, I feel like at this point in time, um, African Americans have no choice in terms of political choices. I feel like the Democratic Party really uses like mob-like techniques where you either vote Democrat or don't vote. It was amazing being in Cleveland and seeing the kind of misogyny towards Hillary Clinton that was so disgusting. You know, I say this as somebody who doesn't support Hillary Clinton, but certainly was uh, so turned off by the way that people talked about her. Uh, I'm here selling Trump shirts, hats, bumper stickers, buttons. They don't want Trump stuff as much as they want Hillary hate items. <laughs> I, I'm not a Trump supporter. I've seen a lot of misogyny on this campaign. I see it every day. I've always said that there's very little difference between misogyny and homophobia. And there's uh, l even less between misogyny and transphobia. Also, now we know that Hillary is going to be our nominee uh, for the presidency of the United States of America. I am very, very excited because I know that she's capable, she's qualified, she's progressive. And now that we have uh, the platform committee that has uh, Bernie's uh, ideas and his vision incorporated into the platform, we're going to work, work very, very hard to make sure that his ideas are actually implemented. I think for progressives, the positive thing is that there was so much energy from the Bernie delegates and you see that energy here, you see it in the climate march that's happening, you see it in the Bernie rallies, uh, you see it in all the different side events. And it's people saying, you know, elections are elections, it's something you do every four years, but you know, we're here to build a movement. And I think there's a lot of clarity among people on that issue. Uh, so I think we can be, uh, see the silver lining in it, that there's gonna be a lot more people involved in progressive issues in the years to come. That was some bonus material from our convention coverage this summer. You helped to make it happen, so thank you. You can find our full episodes from the conventions at our website. Americans, especially at election time, are given the message that their vote matters and that they can have an impact on the result of elections. So they get busy, like the people behind me. But the U.S. almost alone among Western democracies conducts winner-take-all elections. So on the day itself, win 50.1% of the vote and you win all the representation. Losers, even those who gain lots of support, are shut out. Now that would be bad enough, but alongside our winner-take-all elections, we have winner-take-all media coverage. And that, when it comes to making change like the people behind me want, is arguably even more of a problem. 
Let's recap. In countries with systems of proportional representation, candidates are elected in proportion to their party's share of the vote. In the U.S., we don't do that, in office or in the media coverage. On November 8th, Americans are electing a president and all his or her appointees. For the last year, we've heard about little else. But we'll also be electing 34 senators, 435 members of the House, governors of 12 states, and thousands, literally thousands, of candidates to state legislatures. Now, how many of you had to check those numbers? I know I did. And that's no surprise. For 20 years, every study of media coverage has shown that Congress, which was intended by the framers of the Constitution to be the most democratic federal body, receives the least amount of serious media coverage. And mayors and governors aside, unless they're in star-studded or particularly contentious races, local candidates have an even harder time getting covered. Now, I tend to agree with progressive left reporter Arun Gupta on what is at stake at the top of the ticket this year. Trump and Attorney General Giuliani, wrote Arun, would relish using the National Guard to crush blockades of oil pipelines and trains. White supremacists, neo-Nazis, the Klan, and the alt-right would all be welcome into his administration, overtly or covertly. There'd be an all-out assault on reproductive rights and Planned Parenthood, writes Arun Gupta. You can find his entire story at our website. Vote for the presidency. By all means, your vote counts. But unless you're in a critical part of a contested state, it is down ticket that your voice can really be decisive. Clinton or Trump, whoever wins the White House this time around, your state legislators, attorney general and governor will either fight with them or against them. Right now, Republicans control 60% of those state legislatures and governorships. Think Trump is the only problem? Think again. But don't look to the money media for prodding.